Hey guys, welcome to Mad Scientist Barbecue. I'm Jeremy Oder, and today I'm gonna see if I can kiln dry greenwood at home. So recently I got a phone call from my wood guy and he said, guess what, you're never gonna believe it, I have a bunch of pecan. And I said, that is awesome, I'll buy it all. Sorry to anybody in the area who also wanted pecan, but uh, I had to have as much as I could possibly get. The only downside was that it's pretty green. And so I was thinking, well, is there any way that I can get this to the right level of moisture for cooking in a backyard offset more rapidly than waiting for eight months? Also, my neighbor across the street, you may hear a chainsaw going, is cutting down a maple tree. And I'm gonna try to get my hands on some of that too, but it is as green as wood gets because it was a live tree that had to be removed. And I would love to cook with maple and see what it's like because I've never done it before. So I had to answer the question, how can I get wood that is very green to a state that's used in relatively short order. And so what I thought is, I know I've got a food warmer here, I can fill it with wood and heat it up and see if I can dry it a lot more quickly. Now, caveat here, I'm not recommending that you do this at home. Be very careful, this is a food warmer designed to warm food. So don't try this at home. This is for educational and entertainment purposes only. And so what I did is I took that Vivor warmer, so it's relatively inexpensive. I got it on Amazon. I'll put a link for it in the description if you want it. My experience with it, for most people is it either breaks immediately or it's rock solid and lasts forever. Mine has been rock solid and has lasted forever. And so I thought I'm gonna fill it up with wood and I'm gonna turn up the temperature. And you might ask, well, what temperature did I choose? Well, this relates to the vapor pressure of water. So you evaporate more water at higher temperatures. But what you might not realize, I'll try and insert a graph here, as you increase temperature, the rate that you're evaporating water goes up a lot. So at 100 degrees, Celsius, it's evaporating a lot more water than at 50 degrees Celsius because the partial pressure of water is gonna be very heavily temperature dependent. So when you're boiling water, you're getting rid of water a heck of a lot faster than when you're below boiling. So the temperature really matters. So I realized that at 70 degrees Celsius or 158 degrees Fahrenheit, we're gonna be producing a partial pressure or a water vapor pressure of, I don't know, I had it on my little sheet, but I don't know where my sheet went. Ah, nothing gets by me. It's right here in front of me. <laughs> so I realized that at 158 degrees Fahrenheit or 70 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of water is 234 torr, or 234 millimeters of mercury. One atmosphere of pressure is 760 torr, which is one atmosphere or the boiling point of water. The reason water boils at say 212 Fahrenheit at sea level is because the vapor pressure of water is now equal to the pressure of the atmosphere. That's why you have the phenomenon of water just boiling away. Now, contrast that to say 30 degrees Celsius or 86 Fahrenheit, that's only 31.8 torr. So an extra 40 degrees Celsius means a heck of a lot more water is gonna be evaporating. So that's why I chose 158. So I looked at the average temperatures in June where I live. We have an average high of 86 and we have an average low of 61. The vapor pressure of water at 61 is only 12.8 torr. The vapor pressure at the average high temperature of 86 degrees Fahrenheit is only 31.8. So theoretically, I should be able to remove water from these splits somewhere between seven and 18 times faster than just letting it sit out at these temperatures. So what I did was I filled that thing up with green wood and let it run straight for two weeks. Had no issues with the warmer, it kept rock solid. And so theoretically, I should have taken that wood and dried it for about the same amount of time as between four and nine months if I just left it out at the average high and low in the month of June where I live. Now, this is not a laboratory experiment. There are confounding factors. There are issues at play that I really can't control. But what I'm trying to answer is the question of whether or not I can fill a food warmer with wood and get it to be nice and dry and burn really well in an offset smoker made for the backyard in relatively short order and I don't have to wait you know, the better part of a year. So one of the issues is moisture. And a lot of you probably have a moisture meter that's like this. When I talk about green wood, it means a lot of moisture. When I talk about dry wood or well-seasoned wood, a lot of that moisture has dissipated to the environment. The problem with these is you can only measure the moisture content in the outside of the wood. And what they recommend is on the end grain right here, you take this and you probe it in and I'll turn it on and we'll see what we get. We're getting, looks like 11.9, 11.8, somewhere right around 12% moisture. 
Now the thing is, if this were in fact 12% moisture all the way through, rock and roll, it's gonna burn easily in a backyard offset, no issues. What I found to actually work the best is an internal moisture content of 18 to 20%. It's the perfect balance for me between richness of smoke flavor and ease of burning. Because you want it to burn well, you don't wanna fight with your fire to get it to go, but you also don't want it to burn so quickly that you don't produce a lot of smoke flavor. So the issue that I found is that the reading I get on the outside oftentimes does not match the reading that I get on the inside. So I'm gonna break the rules of how they tell you to measure this. I'm gonna split this in half and I'm gonna measure the inside of this wood to see if it's different. Because what I found is there's a gradient. On the outside, it's drier. On the inside, it's greener. So it might begin to light, but it might be a fire that constantly wants to die. So I'm gonna split this open, take a reading from the inside, and we'll see what we're working with. Barbecue cooks take a long time, and so usually that means I have to cook other stuff for my family while the other meat is cooking, because barbecue is done when it's done. And that's why I wanna tell you about today's sponsor, Maiden. Maiden cookware is simply the best cookware I have ever used, and it's not even particularly close. As a matter of fact, we took all of our old cookware and donated it because this was so much better. And the one I wanna to talk to you about today is this Maiden griddle. It's the most versatile piece of cookware that I own. There's a reason why Maiden cookware is used in over 2,000 restaurants, it's used in three Michelin star kitchens, and it's got over 100,000 five star reviews. And that's a lot of reviews and a lot of happy customers. I know that I'm one. And this griddle is simply the best steak searing tool I have ever used. It's great for burgers, you can use it for eggs. It's safe up to 1200 degrees. It's simply a phenomenal item. I had some friends come over a while ago and they said, yeah, hey, what do you wanna cook while we're cooking the barbecue? And I said, oh, we should cook some steaks on the griddle. And I said, you guys go for it. And so on this very burner, on this very griddle, they cooked some steaks. And afterward they said, that's the best crust I've ever gotten on any steak. We've probably all had the experience of trying to grill a steak. It doesn't really work as well, but the conductive heat that you get from this carbon steel griddle that comes pre-seasoned and is non-stick already, can't be beat by any other means. And Maiden actually makes a kit to go along with this griddle. I am a humongous fan of this scraper. I have gone through so many scrapers that break or bend. This is made out of thick steel. The steel goes all the way to the end of the handle. It's got rivets here to hold it in place. And one of the coolest things about this is that this edge right here where it's on an angle perfectly matches this griddle. So when it comes time to clean this thing, this is the tool. Also, there's a burger press and some other items. I use this thing all the time. I highly recommend it. If you guys are interested in Maiden products, specifically this griddle, and you want to save, you can click on the link in my description. I don't know anybody who's gotten one of these that isn't super satisfied. I know you're going to be satisfied too. Some weird grub. All right, it says not to do this. Caveat says not to do this. But I'm gonna check the moisture content in the middle of the split and see if it's different. That's giving me the high warning. I'm at 37%, 39%, 43%, a lot higher. So what we can see is the moisture inside is definitely a lot higher than what I'm reading on the outside because it's gonna be a gradient, totally understandable. So now what I'm gonna do is get one of those splits that I put in the warmer at 158 degrees two weeks ago and see the measurement that I get on the outside and the measurement that I get on the inside to see if they're more similar or if we still have the exact same problem. I got two of the big pieces out of there. I'm gonna go split these. We're gonna do the exact same thing. First, I'm gonna test the ends. I've let these things cool down to kind of room temperature because I wanna get a consistent reading. And, well, that's weird. Let's try this end. Yeah, I'm not even getting a reading. Apparently, I, I would take that as zero, but uh, nothing, okay? So, let me try it on this one too, see if it's just a fluke. 
and nothing. Okay. Well, let's see if we do the center, if it gives us a reading. All right, big money, no whammies, stop. Oh, <laughs> 5.3%, 5.2%. Okay, so the outside is sub 5%, the inside is 5.2%. So what that tells me is two weeks is basically kiln dry. Maybe a week, maybe five days would be just about right. So yeah, this is right around 5%. 5.1. All right, let me check the other split and see how this works. This one was even bigger. Oh, this one is 18.8%. Try another spot here. Come on, get in there. This is 19.5%. So some of it is really dry. This is 19.2. So it seems like it's worked. This one is really, really dry. This one was the biggest piece I put in there and it's right at 19%, which to me is absolutely perfect. So we've got somewhere between a little too dry and exactly right. And so what I have to do is build a fire with, oh, sorry. We don't need that beep. That was my fault. Usually it's the lawnmowers and the construction behind us and the chainsaw, but that one was my fault. So what I need to do is build a fire with each of these. First, I need to see how easily do they each light. Then secondly, I need to see what temperature of coal bed do they produce. Because what I've found is that wood that is really, really dry produces a raging hot coal bed. And then wood that's fairly green doesn't produce very many coals and the coal bed isn't nearly as hot. So to do that testing, I have my handy dandy infrared thermometer. It goes up to about 3000 degrees Fahrenheit or 1600 degrees Celsius. And so I'm going to build a fire. I'm going to start with one lighter cube and see if they light. And then I'm going to measure the temperature of the coal beds to see if this really works or if it just theoretically works. Because a lot of times theory and practice are very different. I'm going to wipe my face off and start all over again. So I thought of a number of different ways to do this, but I realized I have to have the same smoker in the same configuration and the same process. So the damper is going to be set exactly the same. The door to the firebox will be set exactly the same. And I'm going to measure the peak temperature that we achieve in the cook chamber. And I'm going to measure the coal bed temperature. And I thought about weighing out an equal weight of wood, but then I thought, well, that's not really apples to apples because this wood is noticeably lighter than the wood that hasn't been put in the warmer. So I'm going to choose exactly nine pieces of the wood that has not been dried and then nine pieces of the warmer dried wood that are as close to the same size as I can manage. And we're going to see what the differences are. First up is the warmer dried wood that I've allowed to cool to room temperature. And uh, we're gonna use three on the bottom, the next layer of three that are gonna run perpendicular, and then three more on top that are gonna run the same way as these three on the bottom. I'm gonna try to light this with one lighter cube. If one lighter cube doesn't work, I'll move to two and three and so on until it does go. And we're off. So 12 minutes later, you can see we have a raging inferno right here. The temperature in the cook chamber is 550 degrees. Actually, it's a little bit over that and 550 is as high as that thermometer goes. So we have a little bit of limited information. We're gonna let this burn out into coals and then measure the temperature of that coal bed. And then we're gonna repeat this process for the naturally seasoning wood. All right, we're down to coals, so I'm gonna break them up and then I'm gonna show you guys the max temperature I see with this infrared thermometer. Let's get some initial readings. Right there, 1705, it's so hot. Before breaking them up, the highest temperature I saw was 1705. The highest one I could consistently get was 1688. Let's break them up and see what happens. Front row. Being this close is hot. Okay. All right. After breaking them up, 1616. 16. So the highest one I saw was 1705. 1616 16 after breaking them down, which is kind of what I expected. 
Now, we're gonna get all those coils out, allow the pit to cool down, and repeat the process with the wood that's just been sitting in the rack. And just for reference, the temperature I was getting on the outside of the firebox was 768 degrees, so really warm. Cool. When it's already hot and you're standing next to a fire, it's really hot. Make sure to stay hydrated. Okay, it's been several hours at this point. The whole pit is cool to the touch, including the firebox. So we're ready to do the second trial of this experiment. So we're gonna use nine logs that have just been sitting in the wood rack that have not been warmed in the warmer for you know two weeks. So we're gonna start with one starter cube again. If necessary, we're gonna use two, then three, then four, until the thing goes. I'm gonna use this. Four. Five. We're so close. All right. Taking significantly longer so far. We're gonna see if it actually lights. I have a gut feeling we're probably gonna to have to get to three or four starter cubes. All right, six and a half minutes in, and it looks like this fire is just about to die. So we haven't lit the logs yet. Let's go to two. Two lighter cubes. So we're almost 13 minutes in and the fire is actually going now. It's certainly not the raging inferno that we had at 12 minutes in um, the last set of wood, but on this, it's actually going. So we're gonna let this burn into coals, examine the peak temperature of the cook chamber. We're gonna temp the outside of the firebox. And then after it's in coals, we're gonna temp the coals themselves. about 35 minutes in, and you guys can see that some of this wood has burned into coals and some of it's not really burning. One of the things that I've seen over the course of this stuff burning down is water coming out of the ends of some of those splits. So you see water kind of bubbling out of the end. There's definitely a lot more water in here. We've already reached a peak cook chamber temperature of about 355 degrees. It's down now to 340 and a peak temperature of the firebox exterior at 505 degrees. So significantly cooler on both counts than with the dried wood. So this can work to your advantage if you have an insulated firebox and that efficiency helps burn the wood through. But if I just leave it like this, we're gonna have whole pieces of wood that are gonna be unburned at the end of this. So at this point, I'm gonna consolidate the fire and try to get all this wood burned through. And then when it burns all down into coals, we're gonna get a temperature of the coal bed. Now, another thing that's important for you guys to know is the drier wood will catch easily and be more easily usable for steady state cooking. With the wood this green, you need a big fire for it to actually burn. If it doesn't have a big fire, it's gonna smolder, it's gonna go out. I've used some of this wood and it tends to go out. So if you start to close the door down and try to get your temps dialed in, you have a dead fire. So it's to your advantage to have wood that is 18 to 20% moisture like the wood we're using here. So one of the things that we have with this greener wood is that some of it's burned into coals and some of it is still smoldering away. It's not really wanting to coal up because there's too much water inside that wood to really turn into coals. So I could wait until everything is burned into coals, but then most of the coals would be burned through and we wouldn't really get an accurate temperature, which is one of the issues you run into when burning green wood. So first I'm gonna get a temperature. I'm gonna break up the coals as much as I can let them get a little bit of oxygen for a second, then get a temperature again, and then we'll wrap up. All right, let's see what I can get here. 13, 17, 12, 41. Try to get in there where it's real hot. Uh, what about there, 12, 80, 11, 75. The top is a lot cooler, 1,000 degrees. What about over there, 878. 12, 91, 13, 42, 13, I think 13, 42 I saw. Let's try that, 12, 60 there. So I think I saw 1342. That's the highest temp I saw. I'm gonna break these up as much as I can, let them get some air, and we'll check again. As you guys can see, we still have stuff that's, even though I try to put this directly over the fire, it's not turning into coals. 
it's just too green. This was one of the ones that was puking out water for, you know, the first 30 minutes. Here's another one. I can still feel that this is heavy. There's plenty that's not really wanting to turn into coals. I wish this had a little guard here so I could twirl it and feel like Clint Eastwood or something. See, 322, sorry, 1322, 1354, 1387, 1184, 1290, 1349. I was trying to find one of those glowing spots. Oh, I saw a 1427 pop up. So mostly between 1200 and 1400 degrees. Significantly cooler than the previous one. And just subjectively, I'm not, you know, a finely tuned instrument here, but I could barely stand to be by the firebox earlier with this fire. It's warm, but I can put my hand right here and it's not gonna burn. Whereas I was like standing this far away, shooting this infrared gun at the fire and my hand was hurting because of the heat. So there's a lot less heat energy, which means that if you're burning greenwood, not only is it harder to light the greenwood, but it's also harder to build a coal bed necessary to light that greenwood. So I've cooked with very greenwood on an insulated thousand gallon smoker. And even then it's tough to get the fire to work the way you want. What you want is something that will burn readily. The issue with kiln dried wood is a lot of times it can be a runaway fire, but if you reel it in, it does what you want. But I think in an ideal world, I'd have naturally seasoned wood 18 to 20%. So it doesn't want to run away. It produces a rich kind of smoke flavor, but it doesn't fight me when I'm trying to get the fire going. And then lastly, when it's naturally seasoned wood, it works better because there's less of a gradient from the inside moisture to the outside moisture. The inside might be 20%, the outside might be 17%, whereas this kind of fake kiln dried wood, the inside might be 20% and the outside could be 2%, which is good for getting the fire going, but you have uneven cooking characteristics. It's definitely a mile better than having wood that's too green, at least in my opinion, especially in a backyard pit. All right, let's land this plane. So in my experience, the issue with green wood is several fold. It doesn't want to light. It's harder to keep going. When you try to get the smoker locked in on a temperature, the fire wants to die. All those things make it incredibly difficult to cook. You need a big fire for that green wood to really get going. Kiln dried wood doesn't provide the flavor that I want. So naturally seasoned wood to about 18 to 20% moisture, I found to be absolutely ideal. This is the closest you can get in any kind of short term way. So you can wait nine, 10 months for this wood to get naturally seasoned and it's perfect and it just wants to burn and produce rich smoke. That's ideal, but if you don't have that much time, this is something that could definitely work. I'm not recommending this, caveat strictly for entertainment and educational purposes only, but if I were ever in a pinch, I'd probably do this again. Just like the maple that's next door that just got cut down was living yesterday, I, uh, I would probably do the same thing just so I have a good sense of what kind of flavor it imparts. So just another tool in your tool belt that you can use if you find yourself in a tough situation. Say you need to cook something on Saturday and your wood is too green on Monday, you've got a food warmer, you can throw it in there and uh, you know, let it dry out. I'm not recommending that you do that. I'm saying one could. I wanna be absolutely clear. Follow the directions of your warming oven instructions, strictly educational entertainment. But hopefully that's one more tool in your tool belt, a little bit of knowledge that should help you out in future cooks. If you guys enjoyed this video, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. And don't forget to follow me on Facebook, on Instagram, on Patreon, all those places at Mad Scientist Barbecue. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll see you next time.